Hello everyone, um, my name is Kevin Marqueda. I am the lead analyst for Chinese Alpha and um, essentially Chinese Alpha is an equity research platform. We're currently based in Shanghai where we conduct research on small to mid cap Chinese companies and we really go in debt, go into financial modeling as well as talk about uh, the recent financial news surrounding China. So um, in terms of my background, I am a former analyst at Citibank and JP Morgan, where I did a few when I did a couple of um, years at in investment banking. And um, my background is actually in biomedical science. However, over the last two years, I began to transition into finance, where I currently manage my own personal fund currently in the UK. And um, one of our founding members is uh, Kevin Warner. You may know his YouTube channel, um, Kevin John, with 30,000 subscribers. He's currently the head of Accelerator at Xnode in Shanghai. He's also a lecturer at Fudan University and Shanghai University. And in terms of his background, he's a consultant at Roland Berger with various um, other jobs in governments. And this is a picture of him speaking at the G7 quite recently. And uh, nonetheless, we'll get started with our presentation. So um, our agenda as of today is to look at China from a macro lens, really looking into the macroeconomic drivers into what makes China tick. Next, we'll be looking into the regulatory and political concerns, primarily uh, surrounding this year and also last year and why that's relevant into the future. We'll also be uh, briefly touching upon why institutions are now beginning to invest in China, as well as touching upon how much China should be in your portfolio. And lastly, we'll be talking about how to research these Chinese stocks, as well as in financial modeling. And then we'll cap it off with a Q&A. And after the Q&A, uh, we'll do a Kahoot session. And um, to the people who win the Kahoot, um, the top three people, they will gain free access to our premium services for Chinese Alpha, okay? So um, China from a macro lens is projected to become the top economy in the world, uh, predicted by various analysts by 2028. And that presents us a unique opportunity to take advantage of short-term mispricing as a result of the recent regulatory changes. And um, in this section, I'll be talking about the primary drivers in which drive China over the long term. So um, over the last 2000 years, um, China has actually been um, the leading economy in the world. And um, as you can see, China um, shaded in red, as well as India are the two top economies for the last 2000 years. And uh, the reason to this is because China and India have two of the largest populations in the world. And this led to the tremendous growth in GDP and their share in world GDP. And what happened uh, to China and India is something called the Industrial Revolution. An Industrial Revolution, it decoupled the link between human capital and GDP growth. So what happened in the Industrial Revolution, you may say? Well, machines became, began to take over, things began to become automated, and as a result, this broke that link and resulted in the decline of China over the, the last couple of centuries, and also the rise of prominent Western countries such as the US taking up significant market share. However, over the last 40 years, as you can see, China and India have begun to grow. And um, we've seen this uh, over the last couple of years. And a lot of this uh, can be seen in this chart right here. As you can see from 1961 to 1970, you can see China's share of global growth in and around 2%. And every single decade, with the exception of 1971 to 1980, um, its um, share of global growth began to rapidly increase, especially during the 90s and 2000s period, and especially in the last 10 years, where it constituted 65% of global growth. And um, a lot of this growth is actually unsurprisingly due to the tech rise. And um, this isn't something that is um, just specialized to China. Um, the tech rise also happened in the US with the rise of Facebook, Alibaba, Amazon. But the same thing has also happened in China. So when we compare the top um, 20 or so companies 
in 2010, we can see that most of these companies are financial uh, companies or oil companies, and with only two technology companies, that being Tencent and Beidou. However, over the last um, 10 years, uh, especially the last, uh, the biggest, the two biggest companies, Tencent and Alibaba, holding a significant market share, as well as uh, seeing Metuan, Pindudu, JD, and uh, Contemporary uh, Emperex Technology uh, gaining significant share over the last 10 years. And uh, the impact of technology can be felt all across China. And in fact, um, before the technology boom, uh, China actually began to grow due to its low labor cost, and uh, that enabled it to become the world's manufacturing factory. And uh, technology is actually viewed as something very important for its future growth. In fact, we see it as the new growth engine for China. And we believe that technology um, will actually have a substantial effect on the manufacturing sector. So our manufacturing will become more intelligent, and that is driven by a shift towards uh, electronics and also the electrification of transports and also policies implemented by the CCP on a focus on cleaner energy and again driving uh, this technological change. And the reason to why this is so important is because the China's demographics is actually aging. So um, their population is becoming increasingly older. And the reason to this is because of the one child policy that was implemented in the 70s. And because of this, there weren't many young people being born and the population gradually became older. And this is bad for the economy because, as I mentioned before, um, the economy is primarily driven by labor. And if the, their labor continues to um, decline or uh, gets older, then that's going to cause a drag on the economy. And therefore, technology is very important to ensure that manufacturing uh, remains technologically advanced and, um, and uh, machine driven. In terms of the primary drivers behind uh, China's historical growth, again, um, it's due to the labor force. So um, the labor productivity um, increased from $3 an hour to $15 between 2000 and 2018. The second driver that we have identified is large scale capital investment. That is primarily due to government and foreign investments, as well as various reforms, which has funded its productivity growth. And lastly, we believe um, quite significantly as well that China has begun to open up. In fact, um, in 2001, it joined the World Trade Organization and that really catalyzed its exports and directly uh, created an impact on the global economy. In terms of uh, future growth, um, we've actually identified four different factors. So the first factor is being able to promote free and fair competition that is due to regulatory changes. That is something we will touch upon uh, later on in this lecture. Also, a rise in a middle class demographic. Again, China is becoming richer in terms of uh, the wage growth uh, year on year on year. And also a shift towards a service sector and consumer driven economy. Uh, this is driven by the China First policy uh, implemented just a couple of years ago. And uh, lastly, capital intensive manufacturing remaining a mainstay where technology is beginning to replace uh, labor. And um, in its five year plan, uh, the Chinese government has actually um, identified six different industries with biotechnology and information technology leading the way. In terms of the regulatory concerns, as many of you have seen in the news, there have been a number of regulatory changes, especially this year. And uh, we view this as um, businesses are trying to fully align themselves with their political goals. And um, again, we'll briefly outline uh, the reasoning behind this. So in terms of regulations in China, finance and politics are actually very intertwined. And the difference between China and Western uh, countries is that in China, regulations can be enacted more decisively and quicker, quickly, meaning that the Chinese government can quickly change the competitive balance much more decisively than its uh, democratic counterparts. Also, because um, the CCP has very weak political operation, um, opposition, this actually leads to more permanent changes. As um, in Western countries, the governments typically have to run through a number of legal challenges before it becoming law. In China, it can become law at any time. So many people have questioned 
what is the end goal of the CCP? Is it growth or is it control? And uh, we believe it's actually a bit of both. And it's this tussle between growth and control in which explains much of the crackdowns on Chinese equities. And to summarize uh, regulatory changes um, quite easily, the business goals must be fully state aligned. So in terms of these regulatory changes, we actually view these changes as something uh, strategically controlled. And that is because China's leadership is aiming for a period of qualitative growth. And that is to ensure that the company actually, I mean, the country becomes a superpower to become the number one economy in the world. And because of these uncertainties surrounding regulations, this has created a lot of mispriced opportunities in which retail investors can take advantage of in the long term. So as you can see here, a quick summary of the regulations in 2021. It has been really, really in intensive. And um, one model that we actually like to use in order to be able to quantify uh, the regulatory changes and how it affects business operations is through this uh, qualitative framework. Um, for instance, the green bits are good for revenues and also the bad bits, uh, colored in red, are bad for uh, the overall valuation of the company. I mean, com company. So for instance, if a government acts as a buyer of product, again, that's going to cause an increase in revenue growth. However, if things like antitrust or market share restrictions, uh, that will cause a decrease in the revenue growth. And also um, things like lending to companies at subsidized rates. Again, that's very good for its cost of debt. Again, meaning that the company can borrow at very low rates. Also restricting lending to companies can also affect its cost of debt. But this is something that um, you can read in your own time. And uh, I'll be sharing with you the presentation at the end. So um, before you um, invest into China and China shares, there are actually many different types of shares that you have to know about. Uh, the main one is A shares. So A shares are Chinese companies that are incorporated and listed in mainland China. Unfortunately, this is only available to Chinese investors. However, it is also available to institutions and they have to apply for specialist stock connect programs. However, you can indirectly invest in A-shares through something like an ETF, for instance. Um, next would be H-shares. So those are Chinese companies that are incorporated in Hong Kong. That is something that you can access yourself, something that you can buy um, and access to. And lastly, uh, foreign listed Chinese companies, primarily in the US. So these are Chinese shares that are listed on the international stage, primarily on the NASDAQ or NYSE. And typically they have to go through something called a VIE structure in which we get a lot of questions about. So a lot of people will ask, what is a VIE and why is it relevant? So essentially a variable interest entity, essentially it's a legal structure where an offshore shell company has contractual agreements to absorb the profits from its onshore operating company. It sounds very complicated, but to put it quite simply, if you're buying Alibaba, you're not buying Alibaba, the operating company in China. You're actually buying Alibaba, the shell company in the Cayman Islands. And the reason to why they do this is, is one to, um, it's because Alibaba is, is, is in a sensitive industry where um, it's not actually allowed for foreign investors to invest directly into the operating company. In order to get around this and in order to enable um, the shares to be accessed by foreign investors, they have to go through a VIE structure, which enables you to be able to invest in their company, although indirectly. However, there are some cons to this, because um, if you want to challenge these contractual agreements, for instance, if you want to challenge um, Alibaba, you can't just go to the SEC, you can't just go to whatever regulatory, um, you'd have to go to Chinese court, unfortunately, and that means you have very little rights when you invest into a Chinese company, especially if they're listed abroad. Unfortunately, that's just something that you need to know about when you invest into Chinese stocks. So moving on. Um, so why are institutions investing in China? And uh, this is actually according to BlackRock. 
So um, in, according to BlackRock, uh, they see China as a possible once in a generation opportunity. And uh, they believe um, because of the inclusion of Chinese equities into the US markets, this represents a huge opportunity with investment flows um, approximately reaching 250 billion by the end of 2022. Also, it is a relatively structurally under owned market where foreign ownership only currently account for 3% of the broad market. And thirdly, in my opinion, most importantly, it is a source of meaningful diversification. And again, it has very low correlation to developed markets. So if you're a US only uh, investor, you're a UK only investor, if you want to reduce your systematic risk, then it's worth investing into China. And lastly, it exposes you to a growing range of different exposures, simply because the Chinese economy is beginning to rebalance towards domestic consumption, where 75% of GDP growth is now consumption related. And um, this is actually very surprising and um, in the Chinese market. So retail investors reign supreme with Chinese stocks. In fact, retail investors own more than 24% of total free float market capitalization, that is significantly more than the US or UK indices. Also in figure 11, um, retail investors contribute more than 80% of total market trading. Uh, as you can see here, China, and you compare it to the US, which is around 40%, and for the UK, which is slightly below 20%. So clearly retail investors uh, play a huge part in terms of the trading volume in Chinese stocks. That is something very relevant for you to understand. And um, the thing about retail investors is that uh, retail investors have a direct correlation with new sentiment. So obviously the more positive the news is, the more inflow going into the Chinese stocks. However, quite interestingly, um, the news sentiment for institutional investors actually show a negative correlation. Uh, clearly, um, the institutions are taking advantage of retail investors, which is uh, super interesting and uh, something that uh, you retail investors can take advantage of in the long term. So how much China should be in your portfolio? So in this section, we'll give you a hypothetical scenario, which is based upon a average university student. So allocating China to your portfolio, why should you do it? The first reason is it enables you to be diversified. Again, it reduces your systematic risk. Two, um, because of the volatility of China's um, equities, it is primarily suitable for younger people who have higher risk tolerance. Um, you can generate high returns over the long terms, especially if you're able to ride out the volatility. Also it enables you to have exposure to emerging markets and with China being the second largest market currently right now and potentially becoming the largest economy in the world in eight years time, then it is simply too big to ignore. And um, in, all, in, all actu in all actuality, we actually believe that um, if you want to invest in China, it's best to have a staple of US stocks, so US large caps and small caps with about 35% of uh, your allocation to China. So in terms of my own personal China allocation, so my selection criteria is to one, select for long-term uh, compounders. So ideally, um, because of the volatility of stocks, it is something that I see as a long-term investment, so primarily over a five to 10 year horizon. Thirdly, I focus on business fundamentals, and um, that is through attaching a story, so understanding the business, the business positioning, and how that relates to the income statements and the financial statements. And lastly, I like to look for mispriced opportunities, and that is due to a temporary but fixable problem. And a quote that I really like is, a good investment can only be, a good business can only be a good investment at a good price. So in terms of the large, the top 15 largest companies, um, for Chinese Alpha, we actually provide large cap analyses for free. Um, that's something that you can read on our website and they're consistently uploaded every two weeks. However, if you want to access our small and medium cap analyses, they're only available to premium users. 
and uh, here's some price action for various stocks in China. And again, you can see due to the regulatory changes, it's led to a decrease in price over the last year. So how do you go about researching Chinese stocks, given that there are over 3,000 Chinese companies to choose from? I mean, one strategy that you can look for is to um, look into small caps and large caps. So um, with small caps, they're typically riskier. However, they offer re um, diversification benefits and are typically less prone to regulatory changes. Large caps, on the other hand, in my opinion, are better for swing trading, um, simply because there's high correlation to new sentiment. That's something in the next page. And also, if you are an ESG investor, then large caps are the way to go. So um, as you can see here, large caps are actually very suitable for swing traders. Um, if we can actually see in uh, figure five, you can see the average uh, sentiment for large caps, which is denoted in the blue line, actually being much higher than the China A shares, which represent the small caps. You can see that the sentiment scores for the large caps are much higher. And also in figure six, it also uh, verifies uh, figure five for the large caps compared to small caps. And if you really do want to go into swing trading, then a rebalancing frequency of around 50 to 60 days is optimal for your portfolio. However, on the other hand, if you are a long-term investor, it's better to look into small cap simply because there are better quantitative factors. Um, in small cap universe for China, um, there's actually a large uh, constitution of uh, healthcare and also information technology. And if we look on the figure to the right, um, small, small caps actually constitute a large portion of GDP in terms of uh, growth, which is about 60%. Also about 65% of patents and innovations are due to small caps, as well as employment in urban areas constituting about 75% for small cap uh, companies. In fact, China has one of the largest small cap um, universes in the world. And um, another reason to why uh, small caps are pretty good is because they're relatively undervalued. Um, if we look at the PE of uh, China small caps here, 9.9, .9, and they compared that to the US small caps, which is at 20.2, you can see that um, China small caps are relatively better valued. And also in terms of the growth earnings, uh, China small caps at 20% compared to small caps in the US. Uh, for instance, so clearly um, better, um, better quantitatively and better in terms of valuation. In terms of where we source our data, um, we actually source our data through a database called uh, DataS, which is something very exclusive to us. Uh, currently, only UBS and BlackRock have access to this, and this enables us to get very specific company data as well as industry data uh, for us to be able to forecast things. Uh, much more accurately than other equity research platforms. We also have access to various other platforms such as Capital IQ, Thomson Reuters, and Statista. And also internally, we have something called a media bias chart. And the reason to why we have this is because we prefer news sources with no political bias. So we prefer sources like Fortune Magazine, Reuters, which don't have a political agenda. And also, um, quite uniquely to us, we like to use data proxies. And um, the reason to why we use data proxies is because they're less likely to be manipulated uh, in terms of the data. So if we want to look at employment trends, for instance, instead of looking at government um, sources, we can look at a local source such as uh, 51 jobs in order to be able to understand uh, employment metrics and use this as a proxy for growth. And uh, quite relevantly, if we want to look into retail investor sentiment, again, very relevant in China, but given the trading volume of 80%, um, our local source is something like Guba, which is equivalent to a Wall Street bets. This enables us to screen for uh, retail investor sentiment and uh, trade uh, and be able to identify trends before they happen. So in terms of our forecasting approach, this gets really, really technical. So I do apologize to those people out there. However, um, we have two different approaches. We approach uh, every analysis using a top-down approach. So we look at the total addressable market, so the, so the overall uh, economy, the industry, and then we work down from there to arrive at revenues. 
We also like to supplement that with a bottom-up approach, which is our primary approach actually, and that is based on the basic drivers of a business unit and its sales force in order for us to arrive at revenues. And uh, in terms of bottom-up revenue analysis, so again, we start at the company, we source our data from Capital IQ and Data Yes. We move up to industry, we get a Data Yes, um, uh, we get their data from Data Yes. And then we use, uh, supplement that with PitchBook as well as with Zista. And with our bottom-up revenue analysis, we use this for our base case and worst case scenarios. And for our top-down approach, we use this primarily for our best case approach, given that this is less realistic and more optimistic. In terms of our DCF assumptions, in terms of our cost of equity, we actually like to use a capital asset pricing model. And the reason to why we use this is because this is the best model out there, even though it is a very flawed model and quite frankly, it's outdated. However, there are no models out there that currently um, surpass the CAPM. We also like to use a country risk premium. And also quite uniquely to us, we like to use forward looking equity risk premiums. So uh, most people like to use backward looking equity risk premiums, but this doesn't really make sense because you're looking backwards in order to look forwards. That doesn't make sense. Um, the way to forecast the equity risk premium is to look into earnings and also into stock buybacks in order to be able to analyze whether the valuations make sense. Also, um, we do not use a small cap premium. And the reason to why we don't use a small cap premium is because the small cap premium doesn't make sense. Uh, the reason to why it doesn't make sense is because the original study to small cap premium is actually flawed. Um, in fact, um, the small cap premium occurs due to something called the January effect. So um, stocks in January tend to do really well. However, if we um, remove the January effect, that small cap premium disappears. And that's why we do not use a small cap premium. Also, in terms of our beta, we use something called an industrial beta. So instead of comparing it relatively to the market, we like to compare it to um, competitors in, within an industry. Again, this makes it a lot more relevant and, and enables us to be able to analyze our risk uh, a lot more uh, tangibly to the businesses. And lastly, in terms of our risk-free rate, we like to use China government bonds. In terms of our cost of debt, we like to use a corporate bond approach. Again, this is the most accurate way to analyze uh, the cost of debt. However, if we do not have access to this, then we will use, simply use the credit rating approach, uh, looking into S&P Moody's, looking into various credit rating websites in order to, for us to use as a proxy for cost of debt. And in an absolute emergency, we will use a synthetic credit rating approach. In terms of our other DCF assumptions, um, we actually prefer a Gordon growth model compared to a multiples exit. The reason to why we prefer Gordon growth is because we prefer to look into ta cash flows rather than trading multiples. And um, I think most relevantly here is that the growth period is dependent upon uh, the business life cycle, the industry and the sector. And we also count leases as debt. I know there are many accountants out there, but, um, but we are trying to analyze financial statements into the future. And lastly, um, quite relevantly, we like to capitalize our R&D. And again, this enables us to generate conservative valuations. So for our takeaway and Q&A, so you can see here a Chinese takeaway, get it? So um, China offers strong fundamental investment opportunities for those seeking for diversification. In terms of our views on regulatory action, these regulatory actions are a necessary problem in order for future growth. And with quality research, we believe it's possible to navigate the markets and outperform in the long term. And um, this is our Chinese alpha team, the two founding members being Kevin Warner, Lasse Yeratke, myself being the lead analyst, Kimo Bruins, who's currently pursuing a PhD at Tongji University, and uh, Jason Reichter, uh, who's currently the um, senior manager in investor relations at Moderna. And if any one of you want to join our team, we are we do have an application process starting from J December 15th to January 1st. We also have a marketing intern, again, at the same time period. And if you want to join our China Investor community, feel free to scan the QR code 
and um, I'm just going to leave it for 30 seconds then after this um, I will open up the questions in the comment section so just feel free to just comment um, in the YouTube and um, I'll just answer the questions and then after that we can move on to the Kahoot okay Okay.